And for those of you who will just be seeing the video of the uh, homily, I want to apologize again for the fact that I'm wearing uh, sunglasses. Um, my final post-surgical adjustment after eye surgery is tomorrow, so hopefully by next Sunday I won't have to wear these. So I've chosen a reading from John chapter 1, and it's a disguised form of Eucharist. Here's how it goes. Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you caught any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came took the bread, blessed it, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. These are words inspired by God. I want you to imagine the following scene. There's a family, father and mother, and a few kids out for a Sunday drive. The car breaks down and putters to a halt at the side of the road. And dad pops the hood and he's outside with his head under the hood looking in. He has no idea what he's looking at or looking for. But I have to give a little piece of advice here as a psychologist to the women among you. Under such a circumstance, don't ever, ever, ever ask your husband as he's got his head under the hood of the car, never ask him, do you know what's wrong or can you fix it? You'll embarrass the hell out of him. There's only one worse scenario, and that's if there's another man with him and the two of them are under the hood looking at it because they probably have no idea what they're looking for or even what they're looking at. And you're going to really, really, in the presence of another man, you ask him, can you fix it? I'll tell you um, a story of that from my own experience. And Jess Syria is going to really appreciate this one. For a few years, I lived in a town in, uh, in uh, Kenya called Cabernet, and it was on the edge of the Kerio Valley. The Kerio Valley is a spur valley that comes off the Great Rift Valley that comes all the way up East Africa, all the way up actually into the land of Israel. But the Kerio Valley is a spur of that, and it's about 50 miles long and about six miles wide. And there's a huge escarpment going from Cabernet down into the valley. It falls about 4,000 feet really, really quickly. And then there's six miles across the floor of the valley. And up the other side, on the El Gea Maraquet side, it goes up to 6,000 feet. And very occasionally, I would have to travel across the Kerio Valley. And when I was in Cabernet, I had a motorbike, a Suzuki 185 trail bike. And uh, many, of the, many of the Kenya languages are onomatopoeic. In other words, they name things because of the sounds they make. So it's in Swahili. A motorbike is called a piki piki. 
And that sounds like Suzuki making noise. Uh, but in, in, in um, Kalenjin, it's called Kip Duktrut, which sounds actually like a Harley Davidson. And so I had my Piki Piki, my Kip Duktrut, and it gave me constant problems, mainly because I had no idea how to maintain it. I have no idea of mechanics, which is why I have a brother, Seamus, who's a genius at mechanics. So one day, I'm going down into the Carrier Valley, and it breaks down. And I'm right in the bottom of the valley, 122 degree temperature in a semi-desert area, and I'm cursing under my breath. And along comes a Togan warrior, sauntering along. He may not have seen anybody for two days, so he's ready for a conversation. And so the first thing he says to me is, Jamge, which literally means, do you love yourself? And I tell a bare-faced lie. I say, yeah, Jamge, yes, I love myself. I hated myself at that moment. I hated myself because I had no idea what was wrong and I had no idea how to fix it. And I was hoping he'd just move on and leave me alone because I was really, really embarrassed. But of course, he didn't. And so the next thing he says, uh, Mambogani, is there a problem? What's the problem? And of course, I have no idea what the problem is. So I just remain completely silent, hoping that he'll move away. But he stays there and he's fascinated. And he says, um, is it broken? And I'm thinking, no, I just like hanging out here in 122 degree temperature with a motorbike that won't work. And then he comes up with this point when he says, Pengine carburetor di Gumbaya. Maybe it's the carburetor that's faulty. Now, he probably wouldn't recognize a carburetor from a car corn cob, and I wouldn't either. I had no idea what a carburetor might look like if that was the problem. Now, every time I read the gospel that I have just read for you, John chapter 21. And you've got seven disciples who are really kind of depressed anyway because Jesus is gone. And they decide to do what they normally do. They go out fishing and it's night fishing. And they spend the entire frustrating night and they catch nothing. And they're tired and grumpy and sullen. And all of a sudden there's this landlubber a few hundred yards away saying, guys, did you catch anything? And they give a really sullen, no. And then they realize it's Jesus and everything changes. So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about Eucharist in a sense in these times of ours. And I'm going to make basically three main points. Firstly, I'm going to talk about storytelling and ritual. And then secondly, I want to talk about the Eucharist as a trans-dimensional experience. And then thirdly, the coronavirus, crucifixion and resurrection. So there are the three points I make this morning. I believe that once Homo sapiens sapiens, you know, emerged 70,000 years ago and developed language. Before that, Homo sapiens didn't have language. Homo sapiens emerged about 200,000 years ago, but it didn't have language. And then about 70,000 years ago, there's an upgrading with Homo sapiens sapiens, and we develop language. And I'm totally convinced that the first use to which we put language was storytelling. At that stage in world history, the typical band of humans was somewhere between 15 and 40 members. And we were hunter-gatherers, probably in East Africa, probably from where uh, Jasira comes, that area. That's where we emerged from. And we would sit around fires at nighttime and tell stories. And the stories, I believe, had four or five basic functions. The first function of storytelling is to share experiences. So I was out in the bush today and I saw this animal and I start describing it. It's a leopard or whatever and I'm describing it. So I'm trying to share an experience I had. That's the first use of language. And then secondly, it's a kind of, it's a bonding exercise to keep the group together and to create a community. Thirdly, it's a way of educating. So somebody who's had an experience is able to tell the rest of the group, you know, to be careful. These animals are really, really fast and they could kill you. The fourth use, I believe, of storytelling is that the way in which cultures archive their wisdom and pass it on generationally because written language won't be invented for another 60,000 years. And then finally, yeah, it was also to entertain. So we entertained each other by telling each other stories. But levels of storytelling. I'm going to break it just into three levels. There's uh, storytelling, which is poor 
storytelling. There are some storytellers and they're very poor storytellers. They basically just give you the data. Your typical teenage child is a very poor storyteller. She comes from school and you say, how was school today? Grand. And what did you learn? Nothing. Who did you talk to? A couple of people. And so there are some people that can't tell us, you know, they're just dragging information out of them. So for instance, in the gospels, Mark is a very poor storyteller. I was telling you a few weeks ago that when he talks about the temptation of Jesus in the desert, you know, Matthew has a long account. He tells you about the temptations, when they happened, what they were, what the devil said, what Jesus responded. Luke is the same. Mark says, Jesus went into the desert for 40 days, he fasted, and he was tempted. That was it, end of the story. So there are some really poor storytellers. Then there are good storytellers. And a good storyteller is somebody, you know, who does three things. Firstly, they start off with some kind of a hook that pulls you in and keeps you engaged. And then secondly, they develop the plot beautifully. And then thirdly, they end with some kind of a memorable line. So that's a good storyteller. But then there are great storytellers. And the great storytellers are the people who don't just give us data and they're not just spinning a good yarn, they activate your imagination and you take off in your imagination. And I've said to you many times that imagination is not the same thing as fantasy. Fantasy is making up stuff that's not real. Imagination is changing your state of consciousness, entering other dimensions, encountering energies and entities that reside in those other dimensions, interchanging with them, learning from them, and then bringing that new information back into this alleged waking state of consciousness. So a great storyteller is somebody who activates your imagination so that you take off. Now, ritual then, in some senses, I would call it, it's, um, it's dramatized storytelling. It's beyond storytelling. It's a good story, but it's a great story that's dramatized, particularly one that engages all of the senses. So if you think, for instance, of let's say even something simple like the ritual of uh, wine tasting. I live in, in, a, in a place where there's vineyards all, all around me and people go out on Sundays and they visit from place to place tasting wines. Now a great wine tester, and I don't drink alcohol at all, so I have no idea what it's actually like. So a great wine tester will activate all of the senses. So you pour a sip of wine into a glass and then you swirl it around and look at it through the light. So you're visually, you're appreciating it. And then they put their nose in it and sniff it, what, it, what, what it's like to the, to the olfactory buds. And then they'll take a little sip. So they're tasting it. And then they swish it around their mouth so they're actually feeling it. And when you're in a group, then you clink your glasses. So you're even hearing the sound of the wine. So a good ritual activates all of the senses. So it's dramatized storytelling in a way. So you take, for instance, little children who are at play. And what do they do? They take stories they've heard and they dramatize them. So a child has heard about an astronaut, uh, or he's been read a story about Cinderella or whatever. They go out and they activate it, they dramatize it in little groups, and they try to use as many senses as possible. So a guy is going to become a pilot or somebody's going to become a princess or a pirate ship or whatever. So we take the stories and we dramatize them instinctively as little children. And of course, we do this as adults. You take, for instance, an athlete who's training for the Olympics. And the first thing they do as little children even is to read stories about previous heroes and heroines who inspire them. So they start with the story and then they practice in order to develop the kind of muscle memory that's needed and the kind of mental focus that's needed. And then in the great events, something like, for instance, a Super Bowl, it's really a story enacted dramatically, appealing to all the senses. So there's a special stage called a football field. It's 100, 100 yards long. And there are spectators there. And there's music there. And there's special uniforms that are worn. And there's a particular a protocol to how the play engages. So it's, it's ritualized storytelling sports events. And so at that stage then, you have adults entering the picture. And what adults do with, uh, with religion is to dramatize the stories they've heard. All of the sacraments are literally dramatizations 
of kind of biblical or religious stories. I take, for instance, many of you will remember, if you were raised Catholic, the high mass. And the high mass was another way in which all of the senses were activated in a Sunday celebration. So you went into one of these churches with these gorgeous stained glass windows. And so you're visually, you were kind of uh, brought into an altered state of consciousness. And the priest had particular kinds of vestments depending on the season of the year. And then there was this great pipe music, this organ and the choir. So you could hear, even your hearing brought you into the experience. And then there was incense, the torable for the incense, you, know, you were smelling it. And then there was the taste of, you know, the consecrated host. Wasn't much actually, but at least there was some kind of a taste. And the priest then got to taste the wine as well. So it's like you're activating all great liturgy is activating all of the senses in order to precipitate an altered state of consciousness. So that's the first point I want to make then, the notion of storytelling and ritual. And then that will lead up to the notion of Eucharist. So my second point then is I'm going to talk about Eucharist, a trans-dimensional experience. And I have to say that at a personal level, I've been attending Mass for almost 73 years. I'm 73 years of age, so I'm sure they took me to Mass even as a small child. It was the system in Ireland. And I've celebrated Mass as a priest for 48 years at this stage. And I have to say that for me personally, even after 73 years and 48 years as a priest, every time I celebrate Eucharist, it's a mystical experience for me. I've been meditating now for 56 years, but even meditation doesn't do for me what Eucharist does for me. It transports me completely. So at a personal level, that's why Eucharist is so important to me and always will be important to me. Eucharist is literally a trans-dimensional experience. And what it does is properly understood, properly celebrated, and properly experienced. It goes trans in everything. It's a transpersonal experience. Because in a Eucharistic encounter, you're not just yourself, you're having an experience, you're part of a community having an experience, a community that extends over time and over space. So you go transpersonal in a, in a proper Eucharist. You go transrational, and I don't mean irrational. There's a very big difference between being pre-rational, irrational, and post-rational or transrational. Transrational means that you're engaging a lot more than your intellect in the experience of Eucharist. You're engaging intuition and you're engaging your soul. So you literally go trans-dimensional uh, trans in this way. We go trans-temporal. Time doesn't exist anymore. When you get into that kind of space, there is no past and there is no future. There is only the now. So 2,000 years since Jesus celebrated that Eucharist at the lake uh, at Galilee with his seven disciples and us in our community this morning, there is no time difference between that when you truly experience what Eucharist is about. There is no space. We go trans-spatial, not just trans-temporal. We go trans-spatial. There is no geographical divide between us. It's literally a kind of a spiritual entanglement. It's John Bell's theory of entanglement writ large. And so, for instance, from Palo Alto to Jerusalem is 7,436 miles. But when you celebrate Eucharist and you really experience what Eucharist is about, you don't have to travel 7,436 miles eastward and 2,000 miles, 2,000 years backward in time in order to encounter Jesus. Nor does he have to travel 7,436 miles to the west and come forward 2,000 years in order to celebrate Eucharist with us. What happens in Eucharist, it's a trans-dimensional experience in which all of the players are shifted transpersonally, transpatially, transtemporally, and transrationally. So it's a ritualized story which shifts all of us into a totally different state of consciousness. So I want to say then, what, what does real presence mean in this then? So we sometimes think that real presence, as defined, for instance, by the Catholic Church, is that uh, through the power of the priest at the consecration of the Mass, that bread and wine are transubstantiated into the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, you know that if you took a host after communion and you did a chemical examination of it, 
Jesus is not lurking in there someplace, hiding from us. There's not a Jesus big toe or a rib of Jesus in there. And if you were to take the consecrated wine after, after the consecration and subject it to a chemical analysis, you wouldn't find that it has a cholesterol level, you know, which is like the blood level that Jesus had. So real presence is not about you know, the chemical or the physical composition of stuff. Real presence is about the, the mindset or the focus. Yeah, the real presence is proportional to how really present you are to the encounter. Has nothing got to do with Jesus being present. Jesus is always fully available, always fully present. The question is, how fully present are you to the encounter? So the real presence of Eucharist has to do with your mindset, your focus, and your awareness. I remember as a small boy uh, growing up in my grandparents' house and my great-grandmother was alive, whom I called Muddy. And Muddy would have these regular uh, uh, conversations with Mary, the mother of Jesus. She had a tremendous devotion to Mary. And she'd speak them aloud. And I'd overhear these conversations as a four-year-old. Now, to other people, they might have thought that maybe this was just a senile old lady who was talking aloud to herself. I realized at age four that she wasn't senile. You know, she didn't have any kind of cognitive impairment. She was having real conversations with a real entity called Mary, the mother of Jesus. She could step into these trans-dimensional spaces where there wasn't time and there wasn't space and there wasn't distance or difference whatsoever. They were there talking to each other like two sisters and I was privy to that conversation. And I believe then at age four, and I believe now at age 73, that that was real presence. There were real encounters between Muddy and Mary. And so it has to do with the extent to which you are truly present to the Eucharist experience that you're having right now. Are you showing up just as an ego, a skin encapsulated ego? Are you showing up as a soul, an eternal being who stepped out of time and out of space? I remember one time in Palo Alto, in our church in Palo Alto, a kid coming up for communion. And he had his hand in his pocket, like a 13 year old kid. Obviously, mommy told him, go to communion. And he's coming up and he's got a piece of chewing gum in his mouth and he's chewing, chewing the gum. And at that stage, we weren't putting communion in the hand. So I offer him a communion and he sticks out his tongue and there's chewing gum and there's Jesus sitting side by side with him. Now, was that a real presence? Obviously not. The kid went away from the altar just with a piece of gum and a piece of bread. There are other people who come up and their devotion makes it obvious that they're having a real presence encounter. Which brings me then to the situation in which we find ourselves today. I'm going to call it the priesthood of believers. Jesus said famously, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. So I want to speak to all of you out there this morning who are celebrating this Eucharist at your own dining tables or in your own kitchens. And I want to assure you that if you have bread and wine or bread and grape juice in front of you right now, that you are in priesthood. You are as much a priest as the Pope in Rome. You always have been as much a priest as the Pope in Rome. You are as much a disciple of Jesus Christ. You are as much a disciple as one of those seven who sat beside him at the lakeside. You are as much a disciple of Jesus as your local bishop is a disciple of Jesus. So today, scattered as we are, as we are in our individual homes, I invite you to take the bread in whatever form it is and to take the wine or the grape juice and to realize that you are a priest and you are totally entitled to consecrate the bread and the wine and to have a real presence encounter with Jesus. Our scattered community today and we're all over the world, there are people who will see this homily in Kenya, in Ireland, in the UK, in Australia, because I hear from them regularly. And I'm saying to all of those people today, You are a priest of God according to the order of Melchizedek. You have a right to create a real presence of Jesus in your home, in your kitchen, and in your dining table. And together, we will be the cells that create this new form 
of the body of Christ. Which brings me to my final point. The coronavirus, crucifixion and resurrection. We're almost in the middle of Lent at this stage and I've been speaking for the last few weeks about the notion of sacrifice and insisting that sacrifice literally means in the Latin, sacrificere means to make holy. But it also involves making, giving, giving stuff up, giving up kinds of freedoms at the moment. And all of us are being called upon right now to give up particular kinds of freedoms, freedoms of assembly, not going out. Your freedoms were separated even from family members at this stage. That is a sacrifice we're being asked to make. It is the crucifixion of the planet in order to experience the resurrection of the species. And it's interesting to me that this is happening during Lent as we prepare for Good Friday and Easter Sunday. So I want to take for a few moments the seven last statements of Jesus Christ and to offer them as a template for what the world is experiencing and what the outcome will be as we move through this phase. And I'm going to reorganize the statements of Christ from the four Gospels in a, what I consider a chronological form. And the first one is, Jesus on the cross is suffering real mental anguish. And he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And I'm sure there are people all over the world this morning who are saying those things in their own languages, feeling abandoned by God. Jesus moves on from there. And he focuses on his physical pain and his physical discomfort, which is epitomized in the statement, I am thirsty. And I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who have contracted this and are going through the stages, even though they will survive, 80% of them will survive, God willing, they're still having to deal with the physical discomfort of the experience. Our hearts go out to those people this morning. The third thing Jesus became aware of he shifted his focus from himself, his mental anguish and his physical pain to his care for his family. So he looks at his mother and the disciple John and his companion Mary of Magdala and he wants to make sure that they're being taken care of. And he says to John, son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. In other words, look out for each other. And we're being called upon to do that today, to look out for each other in whatever way we can, even if we're separated physically from each other. Thirdly, fourthly, he was aware of his fellow sufferers who are not family members. There is a man being crucified beside him who cries out, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Christ turns and says to him, my friend, today you will be with me in paradise. And there are some people, and that will be their experience. So we have to look out for those people, people whom we don't know very, very well, but people who must be of concern to us also. The sixth statement Christ makes is, it has to do with the fact that we have to complete our purpose. Whatever our purpose is during this period of time, we have to remain totally aligned for it. Christ will say, it is completed. That which I came to do, I've completed, I've finished it. We must be able to say at the end of this period of time, it is completed, we did what we needed to do, we fulfilled our mission of love. And then finally, the final thing Christ says, it's an act of absolute trust in God, where he says, into your hands, I commend my spirit. So we are incarnated spirits, but we are spirits, we are eternal beings. And we have to commit into God's arms the incarnated version of ourselves. So as we embrace this mission and as we move through this mission and we will move through this mission, we have to use maybe this template of Jesus Christ to guide us through this process. I am totally convinced that we are being crucified as homo sapiens sapiens in order that we may resurrect as homo spiritualis. Namaste. So, Lawrence, feel free to unmute people and we'll uh, discuss. If you wish to ask questions, uh, please just ask them and then allow people who are speaking to uh, complete the questions. I have a question. 
Go ahead. Does it work if you just have tea and not wine? So Johanna's question was, if you use tea instead of wine, it doesn't make any difference what you're using. It's the meal. It's the meal that signifies the togetherness. The meal and what's called in anthropology, commensality, sharing table with somebody. That's what makes the difference. That's what transcends the state of consciousness. So it doesn't actually matter what substance is. In today's story, Jesus is not using bread and wine. He's using bread and fish. So it really doesn't matter what food stuff you use, as long as the intention is there, that this is a sacred sharing of the body of Christ uh, as, as Jesus of Nazareth and as Jesus of planet Earth. I have one more thing. Um, sure. I was at the grocery store, and the really wonderful thing that I'm seeing about this is that parents are hanging out with their teenage children, their adolescent children in stores, and their kids. Um, I'm seeing families all together, which you never ever see that where I live, and it's it's wonderful. They're talking to each other and they're interacting, and it's it's great. So that's a plus. Yeah, so I, I'm totally convinced. I've been saying this for 30 years that we're at a bifurcation point in our evolution. You know, between from Homo sapiens sapiens into either Homo sociopathicus if we make the wrong choices, or Homo spiritualis if we make the right choices. So I'm sure that this crisis, there's never a significant shift in human consciousness, which is not precipitated by some kind of a very significant crisis. And this is significant on a global level. And the invitation to us as individuals, as families, and as a global community is to begin thinking how we're doing life on planet Earth and plan to do it differently. Yes, uh, Sean, I had a question in, oh. in community. Um, I've always been interested in um, the fact that when two or three are gathered together in my name or when any sort of sacrament, be it a beautiful nature or something, moves us to kind of a uh, presence of Christ, what that presence means um, of Jesus. What is that presence? Mm -hmm. uh, and can it be had by peoples of other faith? It may not be labeled as Jesus, but I would think it symbolized or actually by the, the message of, of love and compassion talked about in the Gospels and, and the, the various readings um, and the example shown there. That would be, to me, the real essence of Jesus, not some necessarily spiritual, vague presence. So great, great comment, Joe, great question. So in two parts. The first part is, is this possible for any other community besides Christians? And of course it is. I'm just calling it, since I'm addressing basically a Catholic Christian audience, I'm using kind of Christian terminology like Christ consciousness. For the Buddhist community, it is recognizing the Buddha nature of everything that exists. For a Hindu community, it might be Krishna consciousness. And so wherever there is love and wherever there's compassion, there you know, is that kind of sharing. It's not just tied to a historic figure Jesus of Nazareth. It's found wherever there's love and wherever there's compassion. Now, the second part of your question, I don't regard this as some kind of a vague spiritual reality. I'm totally convinced from, you know, from 48 years of celebrating Mass as a priest and for 56 years as a meditator, that it is possible to access altered states of consciousness, which are literally, and I'm not just using metaphor, which are trans-dimensional, in which space does not exist, in which time does not exist, in which I do not exist as an individual person, you know, in which reason is transcended into the ability to rock a situation with the totality of the spirit, not through just my senses, not just through my intellect, but through my intuition and the soul essence itself. So for me, it's not a vague spiritual concept. It's our true home. We are spirits, basically, in spacesuits. We are eternal souls who volunteered for these incarnated, you know, limited bodies. So there's nothing vague about a transdimensional experience. It is more real to me and more effective and more, transform more transformative to me than anything I see through my senses or any kind of mathematics I grok through my intellect. It is... For me, it is total, absolute reality. Further questions? And if you're asking questions, double check that you're unmuted in the lower left uh, of your screen or 
at the top on an iPad. Sean, this is Michael. Michael, uh, morning. So I just wanted to piggyback on Joe's comment about experiencing Christ. And as you know, I've been studying some of Rudolf Steiner. And Steiner talks about our current time when there is the second coming of Christ in the etheric realm of the earth. And um, you're talking about connecting with Christ and love. Um, and I'm wondering if, if this, your thoughts weave in with Steiner's thoughts at all. Okay. So I'm very aware of Steiner's work, mainly through recommendations from your books that I've read about him. I think he was a, a really mystical character. I do not fully align with him in the sense that when he talks about the second coming of Christ, it could as well have been the second coming of Krishna or the second coming of Buddha, because it's basically about the second coming of light and love and compassion. And whatever avatar becomes the kind of the medium for that event to happen, or whatever archetypes we tend to use, I'm not particularly invested in one more than the other. Because for me, planet Earth itself is a medium of, of incarnational evolution. And so whether you parse it in Christian terminology or in Buddhist terminology or in Hindu mythology, they all have the same core essence. Where there is love, there is God. Where there is compassion, there is God. Where there is a prejudice-free group of people, there is God. So I don't want to tie it necessarily to any one system. Instead, I want people who are, you know, fed by a particular system to use that. You know, we have very different food tastes. We all need food. But different cultures and different people will appreciate different kinds of food differently. And so whatever form of food is feeding you and bringing you deeper and deeper into love, stay with that piece. If that is Rudolf Steiner and Christianity, that's brilliant. If it's a Buddhist teaching, that's great. If it's working for you, whatever food is feeding your soul and making you transdimensional, that's the food to eat. Father Sean, this is Andrea. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Andrea. Thank you so much for your sermon. Um, I just keep thinking that, that with this um, coronavirus and everyone being um, having to stay home, that you know, there's less traffic, there's less pollution, there's less air travel. I keep thinking that maybe the silver lining is that this is going to have a positive impact on the climate crisis. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great observation. Andrea. And so in a sense that there are so many factors which are being affected by this present situation. You know, air travel has been affected, obviously, you know, industry has been affected, jobs are being affected, families have been affected, food availability has been affected. So the, the kind of the pieces are falling all around us. And that's not an invitation to despair. It's an invitation, literally, as you put it, to see the silver lining, to say that the way in which yes. we live as a civilization since the Industrial Revolution, you know, has uh, given us tremendous advantages, technological advantages in every way, transport, medical abilities, whatever. But there's been a huge price that we've had to pay for, including the effects on the environment. And this yes. is for us to examine how we do family differently. You know, uh, Johanna was talking about going to the, the store and finding families together for the first time. So family is being affected, uh, affected. agriculture has been affected, climate has been affected. So this is an extraordinary opportunity. It's like Mother Earth is saying to us guys, look, here are the results of your trajectory to date. You know, and here is the fallout. And here's the possible future if you continue doing it the way you're doing it. So let's take a time out here. It's almost as if planet Earth has put her children in a time out, not out of punishment, but saying to us, you want to just take a little bit of time out and consider the results of what you've done? And yes. you want to now start doing it a little bit differently. And certainly climate will be a major benefact benefactor. We kind of get our act together. Sean, this is Susan. Susie, good morning. Morning. So my experience is a little bit different um, mm -hmm. because I'm working at, at UCSF. Okay. And the anxiety level there is at its highest yes. that I have ever felt. And um, it's, it makes it difficult to, to be there. I mean, I've been away Friday, Saturday, and today, and I, I feel the difference. Okay. So do you have any, and maybe this will help others as well, like 
anything i mean i know what the obvious is but when you're in the midst of it mm. it's really difficult to put up barriers around it because right. it's everywhere around so yeah. what to do while i'm there to a, bring yeah. myself away from it sure so firstly susie i want to take you know hats off to you guys you're on the front line the medical personnel right. all over the world they're the commandos right now they're on the beachhead at this stage so i have extraordinary admiration for the courage and the compassion and the commitment of people like you who are there you know, literally on the front lines and dealing with this thing and i can only imagine if for several reasons the stress level for one thing i know there are situations particularly it seems like in italy at the moment where the medical resources are overstretched completely where they cannot possibly deal with the influx of of patients they're getting I don't know if it's reached that yet anywhere in the United States. Or no, but that's the, the real fear yes. is that it's yes. going to reach that level. Yes, I totally get that. And so there's, there's the present stress of being you know, on the front line with the situation. There's the added stress that we, we, we're thinking two or three weeks out and what might happen and mm -hmm. whether the resources are stretched so thin. I mean, I heard, for instance, that there's a decision that has to be made in, from hospital in Italy that they won't even treat anybody over 65 who presents because they can't afford to treat everybody, you know, and they're going to focus on people whom they feel, you know, can really benefit from an intervention. So I'm hoping that doesn't happen, you know, here. But so there, there are all these stresses upon stresses upon stresses. So I'm sure that, you know, this may well be a time to introduce even prayer into the operating theater or into the kind of the uh, triage mm -hmm. or whatever, where people will be much more open at this stage to realize that there aren't human solutions which are adequate to dealing with the epidemic or even with the anxiety generated by the epidemic, and therefore accessing a deeper part of ourselves and of each other, of even inviting people to pray with us before we begin our, 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 our work day, or even praying during interventions. And certainly for you as an individual practitioner, Susie, you know, if, as you try to deal with the stress that this puts on you, it's to kind of just hold the realization that you, Susie Dowd, are an eternal soul playing the role of Susan Dowd in this incarnation. And that, you know, that's the core strength that you have. And just kind of literally breathing into that realization. It's interesting that, you know, this is attacking the breathing faculty precisely. Mm -hmm. And in many, many different languages, uh, the word breath and life and spirit are synonyms. In Hebrew, ruach means breath, life, spirit. In Greek, the word pneuma, which we get pneumonia, is breath and life and spirit. Even in English, we talk about inspiration. You know, to inspire means to breathe in or to take spirit in or to be creative or to be alive. And expire means to breathe out spirit or to die or to give up. And so even to use your own breathing, even if it's behind a mask, you know, breath is the interface between spirit and matter. Literally, it is the interf interface between spirit and matter. And that you must continue to, you know, with each breath, maybe just to give yourself uh, a kind of a post-hypnotic suggestion that even though I'm not consciously aware of it during the day, that every breath I take in, you know, regenerates me. And every time I breathe out, I get rid of my stress or my toxicity or whatever. And just tie literally your work day and your breathing to an exercise or a mantra of self-healing and healing of others. Okay. I would add one final thing, Susie. When you finish work at the end of the day, to come home, obviously, and do something really, really good for yourself, whether it's a bubble bath or meditation music or lighting a candle, whatever it is, to create some kind of a regular daily ritual for yourself that allows you just to kind of uh, de-stress and let go. Okay, thank you. Sure, may, I make a, may I make a suggestion that we all try and commit to say one prayer, at least for Susan, every day, and then Susan, you'll know you're being prayed for, for your health and safety and peace. Thank you. Beautiful, thanks, you. Joanna. So you may have seen as well that the letter which we have sent out has a suggestion that at 7 p.m. every evening, wherever we are, we spend 10 minutes in silent prayer as a community. So obviously then that's a time for, you know, reaching out compassionately to all of our members and to planet Earth and particularly the frontliners like Susan. Yes. Trish. Morning, Trish. I know here in Texas, well, I mean, I live out in the country, so it doesn't seem to be as pervasive as it is in California and 
New York and Washington and places like that. But I can't help but wonder, and I understand it's serious, and I understand we need to be cautious, but I can't help but wonder how much the media is really putting people in a panic mode. So there, there are two aspects to that question, uh, Trish. The first one is, of course, media have a belief of if, if it bleeds, it leads. At the same time, they have a duty to educate us and make us aware of the reality. And so as long as they're reporting statistics, they're looking at graphs and correlations, an intelligent person can induce, uh, can kind of infer their own kind of uh, um, explanation or, or interpretation of it. And so as long as they're giving us data, which we are then free to in, interpret, that's good. You know, they're, they're obviously going to overemphasize some aspects of it to kind of create, you know, media flow to their own sites. So you have to read it with a kind of split mindset, focusing on the data being reported and then interpret it yourselves, uh, yourself in your best possible way. But how do we know that the, med that, that the statistics that are being reported are actually correct? Well, the problem at the moment is I'm sure many of you are being flooded with uh, uh, from friends of yours offering you a whole bunch of different sites and saying, this is the one I found most helpful. You've got to kind of use your head at, at, at some stage and find out what sources are really credible. You know, a lot of people have theories. Uh, uh, if people are backing up their theories, you know, with actual statistics and graphs and kind of uh, statistical inferences, you can place much more confidence in those data than you can in just people who are you know, speaking out of fear. So you're going to just have to uh, exercise critical thinking and do the best you can. But don't over inundate yourself. So here was another very important uh, decision that the board made. And it was, you know, to use COJ all for inspirational, you know, messages to each other. Don't overload the COJ all with all kinds of reports. And I, I found that this was the best thing. And then there's a five page document or I found that this was better. And there's a 10 page report. We don't need that right now. We need to keep COJ all available for inspirational kinds of texts, ways in which we can build each other up. I, I came, my brother Seamus sent me a 3.4, 3 minute 45 minute, 3 minute 45 second video last night of a German musician in the Alps playing what's called a pan flute. And he was playing Amazing Grace. And it was the most inspirational three and a half minutes that I've come across during this entire period. And that's the kind of stuff, if it's possible, I'd like to send that piece so that it could be distributed. Send inspirational stuff that raises our hearts and keeps us in prayer, rather than stuff that keeps us in fear and which is just particular interpretations by particular people trying to kind of, uh, uh, create news. Is that Patricia? Yeah, I'd just like to make okay. a comment uh, in regard to what you are just speaking about, about inspirational things. Um, a couple of days ago, uh, mm -hmm. I was looking at my son's Facebook and, and there was a post <laughs> there. Uh, it was in Italy where they have very, very restrictive rules right now and everyone's pretty much confined to their houses and their apartments. And this was uh, like a, a long, narrow street where all the apartments had balconies looking out onto the street and facing each other. And all these people were singing yeah. together. It was just so beautiful. They couldn't leave their houses, but they all sang in the, into the aisle down the middle of their houses. That's brilliant. Brilliant. Patricia, that's the kind of stuff I would really encourage people to share with the rest of us. That's what we need. That kind of inspiration, that kind of courage and that kind of uh, community. Thanks a million. That's the stuff that needs to go on to COG all uh, going forward. This is Teresa. Teresa, um, yes. uh, A friend of mine made a suggestion that we take this time to learn something new. Uh -huh. And I, I think just adding that bit of creativity to our lives. In my own situation, I feel like this is time I can spend uh, also in my garden and uh, just to watch things grow. And, and of course, being spring, they come to life and bloom. Right. So I offer that for what it's worth. Thank that's, you. That's brilliant, Teresa. It reminds me of, what was the famous incident in our history? Was it called the Donner Pass incident? Well, the entire community got uh, snowed in, right. and what they learned from it, I don't think anybody survived, but there were diaries that um, the adults created classes for the kids, 
And so I want to build upon what you just said, Teresa, that you know, having some kind of a regular disciplined daily life that involves some kind of exercise, both physical exercise and spiritual exercise, or taking up a new hobby like gardening or whatever, that's going to be really, really important to kind of stay fit and to keep your mental sanity. So th these are the kind of things that we need to be hearing from each other. Thanks, Teresa. So let's continue with our Eucharist, guys. So you who are at home, take your tea or your bread or your wine or whatever it is. And as we, as we do it as a community, I want you to consecrate your own food and priest yourself, consecrate this and have a Christ conscious encounter. <laughs>